Hi, and welcome to Viewmaster Travels. Today, it's Real 165 Miami City. In this episode, we're looking to match six very different Viewmaster photos taken over 75 years ago. Retracing the footsteps of the original photographer led us all around the Miami area, but every stop uncovered a new chapter in the city's colorful history. You might think Miami is too modern to be very interesting, but we uncovered some real mysteries actually buried in the foundations of some of the downtown buildings. This revealed a history of Native American people that I never knew about. Anyway, here's the first picture we were trying to find. Matheson Hammock Beach. The first thing we realized is that this beach isn't in Miami. We found it on a map easily and realized we were heading way south of town. We turned off the highway and drove through a nice shady mangrove forest, or hammock, to a huge parking lot. Walking past the restaurant, we found a palm tree lined beach set inland from the waterfront a little, forming a perfectly circular pool. From across the pool, looking back at the restaurant, you get the same view as the Viewmaster photographer saw. This idyllic setting is actually a man-made atoll, constructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps during the Great Depression. Essentially, it's a ring-shaped island encircling a tranquil lagoon, where the ebb and flow of the tides naturally refreshes the water. It's in Matheson Hammock Park, which is currently 630 acres, but was originally 85 acres, donated in 1930 by William J. Matheson as a botanical garden. It was the first public park in the county. The whole area is very nice and relaxing, and the bay itself was calm and breezy with great views. We could see Miami in the distance. But the point of our trip was to visit Miami, so we headed back to the car to find our next destination. The Venetian Pool, Coral Gables. <laughs> The Venetian pool still exists, so it was easy to find on the map. But it's still not in Miami. It's in the city of Coral Gables. It's marked on this old 1930s map as a casino, but like we saw on Catalina Island, that meant more of a gathering place than somewhere you'd gamble. When we arrived, though, it was closed, so I had to sneak pictures from outside the fence. It seems to look exactly like it did in the Viewmaster pictures. Mediterranean-styled buildings, these canal poles like you'd find in Venice, rocky grottos, and an arched bridge. It's such a landmark in Coral Gables, it was even featured as a location in this video game, A Golden Wake, which was about the Florida land boom and George Merrick. Merrick had inherited his father's citrus farm outside Miami in 1911 and was appointed as the county commissioner in 1915. He spent the next five or six years creating new roadways in South Florida. During that time, the Florida land boom was in full swing and Merrick saw an opportunity to convert his family farm into a beautiful planned city. He planned out every detail and spent over $20 million building over a thousand Mediterranean homes. He dug a quarry on the outskirts of town to mine the coral rock he needed for construction. Eventually, the quarry wasn't needed anymore, so Merrick hired architect Phineas Paste and artist Denman Fink to turn it into a grand Venetian swimming pool. The pool opened in 1924. I sent for you, Bob, because I understand you're planning to go to college this fall. Yes, sir, I am. That's fine. Merrick went on to establish the University of Miami in Coral Gables. But weeks before it could open to students, a devastating hurricane burst the Florida land boom bubble and dragged the state down into what would eventually become the Great Depression. 
Merrick was heavily in debt at this point and was forced to leave Coral Gables, so he decided to open a fishing club in the Florida Keys on his wife's property, which seemed to be doing pretty well for him until another hurricane came through in 1935, destroying everything. He came back to Coral Gables to be the city postmaster, but died two years later. George Merrick had become fascinated with the Mediterranean Riviera. He sent artists to study the local architecture, and they returned to create a design part Italian, part French, and part Spanish in inspiration. His Venetian pool looked lovely from a distance, and when it's open, it's open to everyone with reservations. And as pretty as it and the gables were, we still hadn't seen Miami. So hopefully our next stop would fix that. The famous Fishing Pier 5. We put Pier 5 into the GPS, and this time we headed into downtown Miami. We parked at a bayside shopping area and looked around for anything that looked like this old pier. I was starting to wonder if we were in the right place when we came across this old sign in the far corner of an old parking lot. It's exactly the same as the picture. Here's where we were standing on this old map from 1950. This would have been the end of one of these piers. Pier 5 was a very popular spot for fishing and taking sightseeing boats, which is generally still true today, but the entire area has been redone. In fact, these islands, the Dodge Islands, which were created when this main channel was dug to allow ships in to the city docks, were all merged together after 1960, and Pier 5 was replaced with a bridge leading to the new land. This all became the Port of Miami, which today is the largest passenger port in the world. In fact, we went over to Watson Island here to reproduce this picture of the Miami skyline, but today all you can see are cruise ships. The pier was at the north end of Bayfront Park, so we headed through the park in search of our next destination. Biscayne Boulevard from Bay Park. Here's a good example of how much the Miami skyline has changed. You can see here in the Viewmaster picture a little tower poking out above the palm trees. That tower is here in the modern picture. This is known as the Freedom Tower, and this was one of the taller buildings in Miami for many years. It was built in 1925 as the headquarters of the Miami News newspaper until 1957. And then in 1962, it was used to support Cuban refugees, which is when it became known as the Freedom Tower. Today, it's used as a Cuban cultural center and museum. It makes me realize how rapidly changing Miami really is. Back in 1850, for example, only 96 people lived in the area. One of those early Florida pioneers was Julia Tuttle, whose father owned a citrus grove near the bay. When he died, she inherited the property and used that money to purchase a 640-acre land grant on the north shore of the Miami River where it met the bay. She knew how difficult it was to travel to the area from the north, so she spent years trying to convince Henry Flagler to extend his railroad to her property. He refused repeatedly until, in 1895, a great freeze destroyed the citrus crops in central and northern Florida, but left hers intact. She sent flowers and oranges to Flagler to show him that southern Florida could survive harsh winters, and he agreed. He ran his rails to the river, and she divided her land with him. The first train arrived in 1896, and the city incorporated just three months later. Julia Tuttle is the only woman to have founded a major American city. 
Walking through such a new city got me thinking. You often hear complaints that America has no history, but literally across the river from Tuttle's home, we came across an enigmatic structure that proved otherwise. In 1998, an old apartment building was pulled down to build new luxury condos, and during the excavation, a number of mysterious holes were found, cut into the limestone bedrock. They formed a perfect circle 38 feet in diameter. Turns out they're the foundation of an elevated structure that was here over 2,000 years ago. And I realized, People have lived in North America for the last 20,000 years. It's just that they didn't need to build many permanent stone structures, leaving very little evidence of their existence remaining today. But even within my Viewmaster collection, the evidence of the depth of Native American history is clear. For example, these earthen mounds in Louisiana were built before Stonehenge. Some of the famous Serpent Mound in Ohio was made at the same time as parts of Pompeii. The Miami Circle we were looking at was made at the same time as the Roman Colosseum, and the Mesa Verde cliff dwellings predate the Tower of London. So despite the limited evidence of their presence today, remarkable structures all across North America attest to the rich, millennia-spanning history of indigenous people. Which all leads to our last location, and a lot more I had to learn. Alligator Wrestling Musa Isle. I found the address for Musa Isle on a vintage pamphlet. It's here, just on the south shore of the Miami River. So we left downtown and headed toward the airport. Today, whatever was there is entirely gone. Just a large apartment complex remains. What used to be here was Florida's finest Seminole Indian village, which was a tourist attraction where you could ride a boat along the Miami River to a Native American village where people lived, did demonstrations, wrestled alligators, and sold you their crafts. The history of these villages deserves its own episode, but if we think back to that ancient circle downtown built 2,000 years ago, that was likely made by the Tequesta people, who, like everyone else in North America, were getting along just fine until Columbus came along. By the time the Spanish traded Florida to the British in 1763, all, seriously all, of these people were gone, either dead from battle or disease, taken away as slaves, or for a few taken to Cuba or Mexico with the Spanish as they left. So what's with these native Seminole villages? Whose villages were they if all the native people in Florida were gone? Well, in the late 1700s, all that available land was very appealing to indigenous people living north of Florida, and some of them started moving south to central Florida and the Everglades, called Cimarron by the Spanish, which means runaway. These different groups all eventually became known as Seminole. The going was rough for the Seminole people, though, as three wars were fought against the United States, and by 1858, nearly all Seminole people were killed or relocated to what is now Oklahoma. Only 200 Seminole people remained in Florida, living deep in the Everglades, land unwanted by the white settlers. In the end, though, they were defeated by something worse than the U.S. Army. Progress. Coastal cities like Miami were rapidly expanding, and the government was draining the Everglade wetlands to create more and more land to build on. In 1904, Captain Tom Tiger, one of the few Seminole people who spoke English, opened the first Seminole tourist camp, Likely inspired by the upcoming Philippine exhibition at the St. Louis World's Fair, his camp was a place people could live, demonstrate their culture, and easily sell their crafts to tourists. Then later in 1919, Seminole Trading Post operator Willy Willy leased a section of a Miami fruit stand to create the Musa Isle Seminole Village. 
He convinced many other families to move there, and it became the most popular and well-advertised Seminole village in Florida. It was very successful until the new highways made access to the village difficult, and younger generations became disenfranchised with this style of tourism. It closed in 1964. There's so much more to say about Native American tourism in Florida. I found hundreds of pages of interesting articles. It's an aspect of American history I knew nothing about. It's another great lesson learned from vintage viewmasters. Remember, stay curious, explore the lesser known facets of history, and as always, thanks for watching.